The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of Maxwell TV. I uh, hope people can hear me. Let's see if I... Doug, are you there? Can you hear me? I think you're not muted. I am. I can hear you. Ah, cool. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks, Doug, uh, for uh, joining the second episode. I saw you, the PDF you sent me, and I think people are really going to like that information. And sorry again for, for misspelling your last name. I don't know why it was <laughs> Myers for some reason. It, it happens. <laughs> yeah. So what time is it? where you are by the way it's 12 o'clock uh eastern it's uh, right at noon oh, right at noon. okay well it's not that early then it's okay um so no, let no, me no. just check here so everything is recording everything seems fine all right so on this episode like it says in the text i'm going to show you as quickly as i can how to create a uh, pretty nice concrete floor material and I'm going to send you the material file uh, later on I'm going to post it on Maxwell Zone and of course this is recorded so if you can make it you can see the recordings on on the Maxwell Zone YouTube and Vimeo channels as usual and I'm going to try to make it as fast as I can so I can give uh, Doug a little bit more time because I'm sure also people have questions hardware questions questions that never ends <laughs> with the hardware um, and let's see well five people for now i'm gonna start anyway see who else joins and by the way if you have any questions uh just post them in the questions box you should see one in the go to webinar thing or you can also chat to see and uh actually what happens if i unmute everybody well, I'm going to do that at the end, see what happens. Uh, so then, I've made here a little scene. Let me make this window about HD. Okay, and so I just made a little scene to test uh, different floor floors on, and uh, I'm going to send you this scene as well, so you can uh, test it. And um, to put it actually, so it shows up in the menu in, in the uh, material editor, all you have to do is save it in, the, in your Maxwell install folder under the preview subfolder and uh, you can name it whatever you want the only thing you have to make sure is that whatever object you want to have your preview material for example in this case the floor let me resize this a little bit so the floor you just have to make sure that you add a material called preview to it okay so then when you use that as a preview scene here from the drop down maxwell knows to change whatever material you have change it so that you see it in the in the preview here that's all you have to do and so we're going to do this material i just made a, a test render Okay, so something like this. And again, you're going to have the material to play with later on so you can tweak it and stuff just to show you how to get a good start uh, on creating these types of materials. Okay, so let's begin with a new material. Concrete, and as usual, I'm going to add the Diffuse map at the base as usual. And actually, before I start doing this, I mentioned also that I'm going to explain the differences between additive materials and and uh, blending BSDFs just in one layer. So 
course you can add as many BFCFs as you want. I think it's limit is 99 per layer. So what's the difference between blending them this way and blending them in additive mode? So I'm just gonna explain that quickly because there still seems to be new users who have a problem grasping that. And it's pretty important that you understand clearly what these differences are. Let me get all these go to meeting windows out of the way. So I'm just going to start the standalone material editor. Okay, so let's say we want to make a uh, a red plastic, let's say. So I'm going to put the base color red. Actually, not a texture, the color chip. Choose this one. And now to add the, the shiny part. So, of course, if I lower the roughness uh, on this one itself, you may know that the the way the maximal materials work is that if you lower the roughness, they start looking metallic. So you get less and less of the uh, main color of the material, and it's just you you just get a reflection of the environment, just as you would with a with a metal. So we can't really lower the roughness of the main color, so to speak. So I'm gonna leave that as at 100. So then I need to add a second BSTF here. And for this one, I can lower the roughness to, let's say, 2. So we have a really shiny plastic. And I'm going to set the ND to something like a typical plastic strength ND. And uh, I almost always turn on Force Fresnel for these shiny uh, BSTFs. So I don't have to worry about um, the reflectance colors and anything like that. So when you have the, a low roughness, you can actually set these to black. It doesn't matter because we're going to get the proper reflections just from the fact that we have a proper ND for, for plastics, which is something between 1.45 and 1.6, you know, not any more than that. And then turning on force for now. Okay, so here we have a red plastic. Now, this, this looks okay, and I'm going to right-click and store a preview so we can compare with the additive approach. So let's say this is normal blended plastic. So what's happening now is that Maxwell is taking 50% of this one, which is actually a metallic looking material. So if I click here to disable the bottom diffuse one, I can see what just this one looks like. So it looks just like that, just a black uh, metal, which is not actually a metal because <laughs> the ND would be much higher for metals. But anyway, we just have a black shiny material. And since both are at 100, they're normalized. So both are now 50% influence. Okay. And if you find it too shiny, you can lower this to, let's say, 35%. Okay. So you get something like that. Let me actually set it a little bit higher. 250. Uh, let's see, where did the questions thing go? Oh, okay. Right, so this is a normally blended plastic. So let's do an additive blended one. So here I'm going to start again with a red base. Pick the same red hue. And now, since this is set to normal, uh, it's going to hide anything underneath. So I can actually have to both of these material tests, so to speak, in the same window, in the same material. All right. And then on top of this one, I'm going to add another layer and set this to additive mode. And I'm going to use the same settings, actually, from this one. So I can just uh, actually copy it. going on something weird going on with the window well anyway no big deal let's set this to two I think it was yeah two 
And so when the roughness is so low, the reflectance colors don't really matter as long as you have a force Fresnel turned on. And let's compare, and actually I'm going to set this to 100 too, so we can compare. Turn these layers off. So I'm going to store this one and then turn these back on. And store this one. Okay, so you can see here when you right click, you also have some indications here what you can do to, to uh, move between the previews you have stored here. So shift right arrow, shift left arrow. So I can do that so you can better see the differences, right? And you can see there's a pretty big difference here between the normally blended plastic, so to speak, and additive blended plastic. And this is a pretty big difference. And I always prefer to use uh, additive materials because when you blend them normally, um, the diffuse the color is going to look pretty faded because it's it's sort of fighting to be blended together with whatever you have here as a, as a second BSDF. So it's trying to blend between that black shiny material and the red diffuse color here. And that's why it looks a little bit more faded or darker than a normally blended or additive uh, blended plastic here. So... Um, in additive mode, it, it's really adding the, um, the brightness values of this material on top. And it's adding those values to the values of whatever you have underneath. So you can have here, um, you know, several BSDFs in this normal material. And that's why it doesn't actually fade away this, this red color. Because remember, this was just a black material. Okay, where it wasn't shiny and where it's black, where it's completely black, then in additive mode, that gets completely transparent, right? And you have only the highlights that are going to be visible when you have an additive uh, blending mode. So that's why we're not losing any, any um, brightness or intensity of the red color here. Okay, so if you want to make more realistic plastics and you don't want to use subsurface scattering, then I would suggest to always use the additive blending mode. And um, the thing is, it is a little bit more expensive uh, in terms of render time, the additive blending mode, but for me, it's worth it. So, you know, anytime you want to do something that has like a, a lacquered look, so it's not just for plastics, it's also for... Uh, for wooden floors, for uh, concrete floors, as we're going to see, and anything like that, then I really suggest additive uh, blending mode. And, of course, if you want to make it look a little bit more interesting, you can also add, let's say, a, uh, a second BSTF here. So if I duplicate this one, I can have this one, let's say, roughness 10. And in this case, these two BSTFs are going to first blend it, be blended together and then added on top of this layer here, which is in normal mode. Right? And of course, you can also add a third layer, have this one in additive as well, if you want to do that. But uh, it's not really, I don't see a big advantage to, to doing it that way. And keep in mind also that the more additive layers you have, the more chance you can have that uh, you can have maybe some bright spots in the render and things like that so uh, i mean maxwell always takes care of keeping the energy conservation you know physically correct it's just that if you have you know four or five six <laughs> layers in additive mode and they're all set to 100 uh, percent things can get a little bit messy in the render uh, and so of course you also have control by the percentage here by the layer weight uh, to make the plastic less shiny, and so on. Right, so you can see here, it's a pretty big difference between normal blended, additive blended. Okay, so let's move on to our concrete material.
So here then I added the diffuse and now I'm adding a uh, an additive layer. And first of all, I'm going to set all the maps to use the override map channel here. So then I can change everything quickly with the override map here. Change the tiling, I mean. So don't have to do that for all of the maps. And here, if I just set it to, let's say, 2 and just set a pretty realistic um, ND for floor. Okay, so right now it doesn't look uh, interesting <laughs> at all um, because we just have a sharp reflection. So the first thing I usually do is start playing with the bump and the bumps in the, uh, in, the in the floor. So I'm just going to show you a few uh, references. It's always nice to look at references to show you a little bit what I'm trying to recreate. Okay, so you can see here there's there's always a little bit of fading around the, the edges here of the highlights. You know, so we're gonna have to do a roughness map. Uh, we're gonna have to do a, a bump map, or I prefer in these cases to use a normal map because it gives you a more, more realistic effect, especially if you have a really wavy looking uh, concrete floors. And in this reference, you can see that uh, this is a little bit sharper, not so not so bumpy, but there's still a little bit of bump here. It's just that the bump is much finer. And also there's definitely a little bit of a thin film uh, effect going on. So we're going to do that as well to make it a little bit more interesting. You can see here that there's sort of like a bluish tint here where, where it's polished. And we can do that with a thin film uh, layer on top. Uh, so it's always good to look at references of photos, not other renders, but real photos, so you can see exactly what what kind of look you're going for, and just examine the photo uh, first of all. So this is quite different. This one is quite different from this one, and neither is correct or false. It just depends what you're going for. So I'm trying to more achieve this look a little bit more wavy, and a little bit more faded uh, roughness here. So you can see how we can do that. Um, this one would be a little bit easier to create, so I'm going to do this one instead. Just a little bit more, more work, but hopefully it's useful. And let's see. So as usual, I'm going to create the bump or normal map first. And I'm going to add it as a normal map here to the global bump. So let's see how we can do that. Using Photoshop again, I mean, you could use something like Substance Designer, which would be much better suited for this. And you get, you know, automatic tiling and stuff like that. But I just want to show you how to do it in Photoshop just to give you some ideas. And so you don't have to uh, purchase a different plugin. Uh, okay. See if the Photoshop view turns up. Okay, that showed up. So, like in the last episode, I'm just gonna start with a black and white color render difference clouds and when when you run it again it becomes a little bit even more chaotic something like that and so I'm just going for that wavy look now I'm trying to create sort of a wavy map a wavy normal map and I think I'm gonna blur this just a little bit Mm -hmm. 
And if I just test this with the generate normal map from this, let's see what that could give us. Um, if I try to move this brilliant <laughs> Adobe interface, um, let's see here. I mean, that, that doesn't give me enough waves, really. Right, so I'm going to have to do something else before I turn it into a normal map. And I found that one of the, the filters here, if you go to Filter Gallery, this created a huge window. Let me see. Okay, now you should see that. So I'm using here from the the sketch filters, I'm using the Chrome uh, filter here. And I mean, you could, you could play a little bit with, the, let's see, with the detail and uh, smoothness and things like that, but it doesn't do that much of a difference. It's just that it's going to give us a lot more of these w little waves here. I'm looking for. I'm going to click OK. And so I'm going to turn this one into a normal map. Filter 3D normal map. OK, and that looks a little bit more of what I wanted to have something like that and of course you can play with the blurriness and stuff how heavy it should be but we can always scale it down if it's too if it's too much you can scale it down the material okay so something like that when you know it may not be the best wavy map thing but just wanted to show you a quick way you could do this without any any special software um, okay so I'm gonna save that as a PNG and load it in the global bump oops let me switch the screen Okay, and now forgetting to check the normal uh, bump here, normal uh, that to tell Maxwell that you're using a normal bump. Okay, you can see what that does to to the look. And actually, I need to also check here, not forgetting use override map, also for the normal map. And if it's too strong, you can always dial it back a little bit, maybe a little bit more. C70. Okay, something like that. Okay, so this still doesn't look very interesting. We need to make that little uh, nice uh, roughness map for it and maybe I'm thinking I'm also going to then use the, the roughness map as a as a layer mask here. So in this case, I think I'm going to reuse the the concrete color map. So the diffuse map and switch this to Photoshop. And to create those nice little uh, streaks of blurriness, let's say where that polishing machine was was blurring the 
the concrete. So you have maybe slightly directional uh, blurs. Uh, you can do that in in Photoshop with the um, let's see here with the blur blur gallery with the pass blur here. Okay, so here you have this um, interface where you can do so like wavy blurs like this, which is really really nice. Oops. So it's not just a Gaussian blur, it's not just blurring everything in the same direction. It just makes it a little bit more interesting, I think. So you can play here with the speed to really make it blurry. And so you can also combine different blurs. So you can also have field blur, that's just a... Sort of looks almost like a, a, a Gaussian blur. Ah, maybe just a little bit. Okay, so with the path blur, you can also add different dots here. So you can do a really like complex blur here. It's really nice to do, um, you know, for automotive renderings, you can do like a path blur for the images, you know, something like that. You get the idea. Then press OK. And I'm just going to add uh, levels here to make it a little bit more contrasty. You know, something like that. And I'm going to save that as a PNG and import it. So here in the roughness, let's see. So this one I did before is just slightly different. I mean, uh, just so you get the idea of, of what I did. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, this one. Okay, so right now it's not going to make that much of a difference because I set the roughness here to be just two. So the the darkest or the brightest values here in this roughness map, they're just going to go up to a roughness of two. They're not going to go higher than that. But you'll see in a bit that it will make a much nicer difference when I duplicate this one. So actually, let me uh, put this like shiny. Call this more more blurry, and for this one, I'm going to use maybe a max of 11 roughness. Okay, and there you're going to start seeing a little bit more influence of this roughness map, maybe even more, say 20. Okay, and here you start seeing that little nice faded look on the reflections. And I'm still just using the same uh, the same map. It's just it goes up to a roughness of 20 now for the for the brightest values in the map. Okay, and right now they're blended equally. So this is nice because you have a lot of flexibility here of what you want to do depending on, on your reference. So for example I could lower the influence of just the, the shiny one that goes up to roughness two. So now I'm going to have an overall, a more blurry looking concrete floor. And maybe the bump is too much now, actually. Global bump. And did I set this now? I forgot to use the override map for this, these ones. Okay, so you have a lot of flexibility of what you want to do here, depending on your references. Uh, in this case, I'm going to leave this one 
I wanted more shiny and maybe lower the influence of this one a little bit. So we, we're seeing mostly the, the, the sharp polished floor, but just a little bit of faded polished look here. And to make it even more fancy, fancy we can duplicate this one as well. And I'm just moving it on top to have it clear for me, but it doesn't matter. The order of the BSDFs doesn't matter when you're inside a layer. They're always going to be blended normally and, and normalized. So it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not like for the layers, uh, in which case the, the, which one is on top, you know, matters. So this one, I'm going to name it, let's say even more blurry and have a little bit less influence. I'm going to set this up to, let's say 40, a maximum roughness. Okay, so here I'm starting to get a, a pretty nice, interesting look. And to control a little bit more where the shiny parts are, and just to have not just an equal amount of, of, of uh, shininess intensity, I'm going to drag and drop the roughness texture here for the opacity for the entire layer here. I think, yeah, it's this one. It's just a little display bug here. So I'm not using the, the diffuse. I'm actually using the the roughness map here. And uh, let's see if I change the contrast just a little bit more to have a little bit more variation. Let's see what that does. Yeah, I think that makes it more interesting. You can see here. It looks just a little bit faded here and there. Just breaks up that perfect shiny look a little bit more. And if I increase the contrast even more, I can have even more variation here. Okay, so something like that. And as a final little thing with the with the coating, so this will look pretty good, but if we we want to take it further and make it even more realistic, uh, I'm going to add a coating to this and I'm going to add it as per the um, little coating trick explained by Tom the famous Maxwell user, Tom, on the Maxwell blog. So if you go to the Maxwell blog and search for that tutorial with the coatings, you'll find it. Um, and it explains in a little, in a little bit more detail of uh, why you're, you're doing it in this way. So I'm going to add a third layer, also set it to additive mode. And I'm going to add a coating to this BSDF here. So right click, add coating. But the trick is actually that um, I'm going to set the reflectance colors to black. And the most important thing is that you set the ND to 1. So essentially what we've created now is a invisible uh, BSDF by setting the ND to 1 and the reflectance colors to 0. And uh, actually also the roughness to 0. Okay, so now it's only the coding that's going to be visible, but the trick is actually that now we can use a bump in the BSDF that's actually going to influence the coding, even though the BSDF is invisible. Okay, and the second advantage, of course, is that we can lower the effect of the coding, the influence of the coding, simply by lowering the, um, the layer weight here or the, the layer opacity. Okay, so for the coating, I'm going to set the uh, thickness to something that's going to give me a little bit of sort of a violet blue look and set the, and the, for the coating, it doesn't matter so much, just, you know, don't set it very high. 
to get a more uh, predictable uh, look in the thin film. And I also like to turn on force for now for the coating. So if I preview that, and you can see now, you can see the influence of the coating. And just to see what the coating looks like, I can turn off the entire additive layer here. So I just see the coating and the bottom diffuse. Okay, so you can see there is a little bit of bump in the coating because I have the global uh, bump turned on. But to make it more interesting, I can add a, uh, a specific bump map just to the, this BSDF. So it's just going to influence the bump look of the coating itself because right now it looks still a little bit too, too uh, I don't know, shiny or, or sharp the coating. So I played around with different bump maps. One was simply uh, blurring a little bit the diffuse texture. And let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to lower the bump, not so high. So you can see what that looks like. Maybe a little bit higher. So again, this is a nice trick to use um, because you can have the, co the bump of the invisible BSDF still affect uh, the coating here. Right, so after I played with that a little bit, I said it's not, you know, it's not looking bumpy enough. So then I tried a second bump map where I simply blended in Photoshop that uh, that path blur together with the um, the blurred version of the concrete texture. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, and that still didn't give me the amount of blur I wanted or amount of, you know, bump I wanted on the coating. And then the third one, I just, I also added and blended a little bit the original sharp concrete texture on top. And that's going to make it, you know, very blurry, as you can see, the coating. Maybe that's even a little bit too much. So I'm going to lower this to, let's see, 10. Yeah, something like that. I think I like that. OK, and now turning back on the, the shiny BSDF layer. As you can see what that looks like. That gives a nice quite nice look and if I click here the the lock icon I can make changes without having to click the preview all the time so I can play with the uh, the thickness here so let's say start from 90 see what color that gives me I can switch off the additives and that's mostly white so that's need to make it a little bit thicker 30 anyway it's a, it's a lot of fun to play <laughs> with this stuff I spend days on it uh, it's, it's a yellow coating if you'd like to have that but around 200 250 300 you get this nice violet blue look let's see if I make it even more oops yeah I think that looks pretty nice And now, of course, it's much too strong unless you're looking for that effect. So I'm just going to lower the layer weight. It's very easy, very simple. So you get a more faded, very subtle, sort of a thin film interference look. Maybe even that is too much, so 15. All right, and that's pretty much the finished material. So the coating on top, three different BSDFs 
with three different roughness settings just to really have a nice nice glowing highlight which you see on these concrete uh, materials and just a diffuse underneath okay and again I'm gonna send you this material so you can play with it and also the uh, the preview scene so you can play with the preview scene here it's just uh, very simple so I added a material here on one end and then an emitter here on the other end and this emitter I made it uh, hidden to camera so it doesn't interfere with the camera and just so I can still see the corridor in, in the renders, I also set the, or, or in the viewport, so I can see where I move the camera. Uh, I changed the shading mode here from textured blend to bounding box. And in that case, um, a lower shading mode here will override whatever you have set here in the shading mode in the viewport itself. Okay, so in this way you can have, uh, you know, you don't get these objects uh, obscuring your, your view of the camera, but they're, they're still there. They're not hidden. Okay, so I think that's it for this one. I try to make it as quickly as possible. Let's see. Yeah, just 40 minutes. Uh, anyway, um, Doug, are you still there? Are you muted? Let's see, hello? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Great. So it just took 40 minutes. I hope you're not <laughs> too bored with this. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you. I learned something here. Really? <laughs> good. That's good to hear. Because uh, I saw in your PDF you've been using Maxwell since the Alpha days. So, you know, you probably know most of this stuff already. Uh, let's see if there are any questions or stuff. Well, we can do that in, at the end, maybe the questions. So uh, you can you can get started with your presentation now. Okay. Let's see. I'll make you a panelist. Or presenter. Sorry. Okay. Are you ready? One, two, <laughs> three. <laughs> Uh, yes, okay. I think something should have happened on your yeah. side. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I can see your screen now. Uh, nice. You see the, uh, the PDF here? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay. All right. Um, well, I guess let's go. Uh, uh, my name is Doug Meyer. Uh, I am a senior designer uh, at Procter & Gamble. Uh, I have a design background and uh, I also uh, design and manage a lot of the infrastructure uh, that we use here uh, specifically for the design group, um, and, you know, based around high performance uh, visualization computing and so on. Uh, and I have been a Maxwell user uh, since uh, the beta. I remember paying $200 to get an, well actually before that even the alpha cut uh, in around about 2004, because um, it was a technical curiosity for me at that time, but it wasn't particularly useful in production um, way back then. So, uh, but so it's come a long way. Yeah, the good old days, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I, I, rem I remembered uh, you know doing that and then uh, seeing our company logo on the next limit website you know kind of proudly displayed as a, as a client which i thought was kind of funny for her <laughs> yeah, cool now yeah, i was amazed of the difference of the quality back then you know most it was just mental ray i guess back then yeah pretty much yeah uh, um so um so just briefly as uh, just for some context what we do uh here is we've got uh, about 12 designers spread across the globe uh we do all sorts of um, motion design 3d um animation and uh, product design video, kind of the whole gamut, uh, both for internal and consumer facing ad content. Um, we also do a lot of uh, research into new visualization technology that we need uh, in order to do our primary work, which is product design um, and uh, develop new methods to, to figure out what it is that people actually want to buy. Uh, so let's see. 
So in terms of infrastructure, um, what we actually use is we have a, a mix of Mac and, and PC workstations. Uh, we typically let people use whatever they're most comfortable and will be the most productive with rather than trying to force fit something. Um, the render farm that we all, the, those 12 of us use though, is um, uh, consists of about 120 Dell power edge dual Xeon systems. Um, so we've been primarily CPU based until just recently. Um, uh, utilizing a variety of renders, as you can see here, uh, Maxwell is probably our most used one, uh, but we also use Arnold, uh, V-Ray, Redshift, um, and also some Modo and Keyshot, depending on the application and depending on the user. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, And then also Cube runs on uh, everything on top of it uh, for us. So primarily, um, out of that list, you've got V-Ray's got GPU capability, of course, um, Redshift is, is exclusively GPU. Um, and Arnold has GPU in development, as does uh, Maxwell is starting to, to get into the GPU world also. So, may I, may I just say something? I think you're a cool company because you're not using 3S Max. You're, just, <laughs> you're using <laughs> just my Cinema 4D. That's good for you. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Somebody you doesn't know, use funny. Max. Yeah, it's funny. I actually do have a copy of Max, but um, the only thing that we use it for is uh, occasionally to convert files that we'll get in from CAD right. software. Right. Um, and it was given to us as a consolation prize when they uh, canceled <laughs> Soft Image. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. We were angry because we used to use Soft Image uh, to some degree, and and when that was killed, then they just they gave us 3ds Max to, mm. I don't know, make up for it, I guess. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, that's, so. that's cool. <laughs> I know how to I know how to open Max and convert uh, an STL file, and that's about it. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna go through. I've got a, probably half a dozen slides coming up of hardware suggestions at various price points because you know most people kind of approach this from I have a I have such and such budget and you know how much can mm -hmm. I get for that. Yeah. Um, so. And in the real world, though, everyone, uh, nobody uses exclusively one software. So um, just take these as suggestions based on uh, the price points that we have and, and just optimizing specifically for Maxwell um, as it sits today. Um, because, for instance, it's, um, there is a GPU engine in Maxwell, but it is very much a work in progress um, and does not support uh, multiple GPUs. Um, so at least right now, um, if Maxwell is your primary tool, it doesn't really make sense to do multiple GPUs uh, in your machine. So mm -hmm. that very well will change, and from the sounds of it, it's going to change relatively soon. But, um, you know, yeah. um, the GPU technology changes so quick, it's like just wait until it's time. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, I, I started with um, a $2,500 system, and, and I'll, make, I'll make all of these lists kind of available so you don't have to hurry up and write uh, this down if anyone is uh, is interested in any of them. Um, but these are all examples of um, uh, systems that we've built recently. Um, and all of this stuff, you know, anytime you look up computer hardware on the internet, uh, you, you're bound to wander into a, a, a holy war of who thinks what is the best. Um, so more or less just take these. Um, so with the, the Intel series is uh, kind of on the lower end uh, on the on the Z370 uh, motherboards uh, is probably the best single threaded performance you're going to get, and those are up to six cores, um, but still with the 1080 Ti GPU uh, involved, so that you can uh, start to start to play with the Maxwell uh, GPU engine. And in the as far as GPUs are concerned, the 1080 Ti is the best, uh, I would say. The, the 1070 is probably technically the best bang for the buck, but in terms of getting something that's high performance for not that much more money, uh, the 1080 Ti, if you can find them, um, are the sweet spot right now. Okay. Uh, from a cooling standpoint, I've got the Corsair H115i there. That is a um, all-in-one uh, liquid cooler, so it, it, you do get the performance of liquid cooling without having to do some kind of crazy custom uh, loop. Um, alternatively, um, you can also use something like a Noctua air cooler. We use those a lot also, and they perform uh, almost as well uh, for a, a little bit less money. 
And can I just add something about the coolers here? Um, I have mm -hmm. the impression that the these kinds of coarser, like let's say a hybrid cooling, is is pretty much become the standard, right? And and regular fans are becoming less and less usual, right? So there is better performance at using a a CPU uh, water cooler than fan, right? Um, a little bit better. Uh, I mean, it kind of depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're going to overclock um, the CPU, then I would probably definitely look at a at something like an H115 or a 110, something like that. Um, and some of these kind of depend on what case you choose, um, mm -hmm. what it's able to house. Right. Um, so there's a little bit, it's kind of a puzzle you need to put the pieces in, uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, one at a time. Yeah. Um, it's not too bad, but, uh, but you know, there are some considerations there. Uh, the Noctua stuff is, is actually surprisingly good though, but it does require that you have a, a higher requirements for incoming case airflow. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, it's not as if you cannot use um, air cooling in an overclock situation. It's just that, you know, you might be limited to four gigahertz rather than four and a half or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've used, used both just depending on the application. Um, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, do, do do these have like a, a lifetime? I mean, that liquid, I suppose it has some sort of... Uh... I don't know substance inside of it, so it doesn't grow yeah. algae or something. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, I well, I've got systems here with like old school H nineties in it that I've never touched, and they're five years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I wouldn't worry about that too much. What I find is that you're probably going to want to upgrade your computer by the before before it. it uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, not really. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, if you move up in price a little bit, you can get into something like the, um, and this is a 3200. Uh, these are all US uh, prices, just kind of what I found on the, you know, mm -hmm. what they were currently going for. Um, you can get the AMD uh, Threader for 1950 CPUs for around 900 US uh, today, if you, if you look around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is probably the best value in terms of kind of still a, a, a fairly high performance configuration, but, uh, but not, not costing an, an inordinate amount of money. Um, the, uh, ASRock three X three ninety nine type C motherboard, these are kind of hard to find. Um, but in terms of a, one of the cheaper motherboards that still, um, has a good configuration and a, a pretty good uh, power layout. Uh, these are these are pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. Memory. Um, you, one difference you'll notice from the Intel slide to the AMD slide is it does use a faster specified memory, um, particularly if you're uh, considering overclocking the Threadripper systems. Um, they're quite sensitive, more so than the Intel systems, to the speed of memory, just due to the way the caches are built into the CPUs. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you may want to pony up for a little bit better memory on there. Now this, I mean, in Maxwell's probably not going to care all that much, but if you're in something like a video editing software or After Effects, things like that, with a little bit more uh, memory throughput than, than Maxwell's going to have, uh, you will notice a difference in performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's good info. And um, this this thread ripper, I mean, I read somewhere that you know it has a lot of cores, but each core is is uh, uh, less powerful than let's say the 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 first CPU you showed the i7 yeah. 8700 8, right I mean right uh, so if you still have single uh, single threaded tasks then the thread ripper may not be <laughs> uh, that suitable right well sure yeah I mean it, it it's always going to be a mix um, it's not as if the thread ripper single threaded performance is terrible, but no, it, it isn't going to be as high as the 8700. Mm -hmm. um, but the rendering performance will be significantly higher uh, in the 16 core CPU versus the six. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's just trade offs, you know, yeah. what's more important to you. Mm -hmm. um, what a lot of people will do uh, if they want to go multiple machines is they'll do something, you know, if they're animating in Maya, um, and things like that, they'll, they'll do something like the 8700 as the artist machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, they'll have a number of Threadrippers or, or Xeon boxes with many cores that are all 
you know, individually slower, um, mm -hmm. but they'll use those in, for the render farm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Right. So, um, so, um, this, but still overall, uh, it's rendered for pretty good value. Um, uh, all things considered. So, uh, AMD is definitely under the right circumstances, kind of back in the game, uh, compared to the last few years, uh, with the, with the Threadripper series. My only, um, my only complaint about, uh, Threadripper really is that the sockets are kind of a pain to deal with, uh, in terms of getting the CPU seated properly, uh, in them compared to something like a Core i9. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, you only have to do that once. So, um, not that big a deal. Well, m most people only have to do that once, but, uh, when, <laughs> uh, yeah, which I'll get to a little bit, a little bit later. <laughs> yeah, not for you, right? You have to yeah, do it all the time. Uh, yeah. Um, so moving up in performance uh, and price a little bit. Um, right now, uh, for me, this is probably the sweet spot in terms of somebody wanting a high-end system um, for use with Maxwell as far as kind of an all-rounder. Um, the... Uh, 18 core Intel i9s. Uh, what I like about them is sure you get 18 cores, but they actually respond really well to um, overclocking. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the right motherboard and some good cooling, you can pretty easily get these to run at 4.2 gigahertz or or faster. Uh, we've got some here running in the four four and a half to 4.6 range, um, and those are you know running as render nodes basically 24/7. Um, and perform quite well, both in single threaded and multi-core tasks. Um, one thing you need to be careful with if you're on i9, if you're going to overclock is uh, you need to be choiceful about which motherboard you choose. Uh, some of the early X299 series uh, boards were not very good in terms of power delivery. Um, uh, a lot of the manufacturers kind of underestimated how much power uh, the Skylake um, chips were going to consume, particularly when they are overclocked. Um, but uh, the one I have listed here, the WS uh, Stage Board and a few others I've got on a slide coming up, um, have got the dual 8-pin VRM and the, and the VRM cooling design upgrades that the kind of second generation of X299 boards all have. So, mm -hmm. okay. And yeah, and what I mean, what will happen like if you choose something like um, I don't know, an Asus uh, like Prime X299, which is one of the early boards, uh, it'll work. It's just that it, anything over about 4.2 gigahertz or so, uh, you're going to get overheating problems actually on the board itself, uh, not on the CPU. Mm. So Right. And that, that can be pretty bad because then uh, the motherboard <laughs> uh, burns up. Yeah, well, mm. it'll just, you'll start getting, you know, what'll happen is you'll get two minutes into a render and then your machine's mm. going to blue screen. Yeah, hmm. uh, because the the VRMs got too hot, which are basically the um, the heat sinks that regulate the input voltage to the processor. Um, hmm. And this is like this is a pretty well known problem at this point. So the newer designs do a lot better job of it. But um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway. is is there some way on the on the package now that you can tell if it's a it's a a better revision on or. Um, I've got, uh, well, I've got a, a list of kind of preferred boards um, coming up in a slide. There isn't really a way to tell on the on the package per se, other than um, just which actual model it, it is. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, because, yeah, just the ones that were released earlier, um, in, you know, have the older VRM design uh, versus some of the later stuff. So, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. On all this, all this stuff, um, you know, I'm on the forum, so fairly often people can ask if they have questions too. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, one one difference on here is I also did upgrade the power supply. When you get up into uh, this class of machine, uh, we've been using the AX 1200 uh, series for quite a long time, um, and the the CPUs on these, especially if you're pushing them with an overclock, can consume quite a lot of power, um, mm -hmm. 450, 500 watts just for the CPU, if you're running <laughs> that's, at. That's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot, um, it, you know, but that's at, you know, four and a half days um, mm -hmm. up in that range. So you have to kind of plan for more than you might think. So, so I mean, uh, this is a 1200 watt uh, uh, PSU, right? Because yes. The, right, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's quite a lot. I mean. Yeah, it, well, it, yeah. It won't always consume 1,200 watts, but at least no, 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 no. <laughs> it's good that yeah. the power is there but, when needed. 
Right. But like measured performance, like let's say you had this machine and you put um, two GPUs in it mm -hmm. and you put like two 1080 Ti's and, and you were using something like uh, V-Ray in hybrid mode, which will push both the CPU and the GPUs at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, under rendering in that, you could easily see 800 or 850 watts being consumed uh, during mm -hmm. a render. Hmm. So it'd be very fast, but it would take that much power. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a lot actually. Comparing to some you know common household appliances that take almost one kilowatt. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's yeah. I mean, that's a, a big microwave that you're running there. So yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of microwaves at least here are in the 800 to one kilowatt range. So hmm. interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's all. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, power usage, that, that'll depend, on, of course, on what country you're into. Um, if you're running it on a, on a 220 volt circuit, it'll be less, right? So um, this is all, you yeah. know, American values, <laughs> so right. to speak. You have to, yeah, you have to change with the, with the voltage. Correct? Right, yeah, yeah, I adjust it for you. Um, so we we've recently built one of these. Actually, it's similar. It's actually somewhere between the this one I'm showing and the next one. Uh, if you want to get into the dual processor game, um, and all of the stuff that I'm showing is kind of current. The what is the current gen? Uh, rather than digging through previous gen Xeons and things like that, I know a lot of people like to go on eBay and and you know get stuff that's been pulled out of data centers and and run dual processor boards and and that's all cool. But um, uh, to me, if you're going to go with the Xeon SP line uh, in a dual processor format, there really isn't much sense in doing it unless you're going to go up to something like the, the CPUs that we have uh, shown here. Um, hmm. Anything below this, frankly, you're better off with the eight, the, the 18 core i9. Right. No, and, that, that's um, interesting because just 7,000 <laughs> for for two CPUs, that's quite a jump yeah. from 5,000 to 15,000. It's Three times. Yeah. Well, what I I mean, but basically, what we're looking at is like, from to go from here, like this machine, you know, in an overclock state at something conservative, even like four point three or four gigahertz, and then to jump to this, you mm -hmm. have a three x cost. Um, well, now consider I also have three GPUs in here, but even if you or four GPUs, um, but even if you took that down, you'd be in the, uh, you know, twelve thousand dollar range. So Mm. You're going up at one and a half times or approximately mm. cost, and you're only going up about fifty or sixty percent additional performance. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah. Mm. So you know the, the eternal question of, uh, you know, what do uh, you know, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, I don't, that's really a personal choice. You know, is the fifty percent better performance in your interactive, you know scene development worth two and a half times as much money for most people probably not but for some people it is so yeah yeah um, i i have a question about the the memory is it still necessary to have a uh, um, ecc ram in in xeon systems or is that that just a recommendation uh no it's mandatory oh it's mandatory okay yeah yeah, I know, uh, in all Xeons uh, require uh, ECC memory, um, and this one I have, tw this might seem like a lot, and it probably is, but um, these are, the, the Intel Xeon CPUs, uh, the Xeon, uh, this series are six channel memory design, uh, so with two CPUs, in order to get full memory bandwidth, you need to have 12 DIMMs, mm -hmm. and they don't really... You can't, it's pretty difficult actually to find ECC RAM below 16 gigs per stick nowadays, or if you do, you're not going to save much money, mm -hmm. um, you know, going down, down to like an eight gig uh, type setup. Um, so, right. yeah, the i9, i9 series does not support ECC. Um, Threadripper uh, does sort of, it's, I don't know if they're still officially calling it out. I know that they will work with ECC memory in them. Um, but I wouldn't consider it a requirement, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, one interesting thing about this motherboard that I have called out here is this is the X11 series. So, for instance, if you're familiar with um, uh, box technology workstations, they have uh, an Apex 5 series machine that allows you to have four 
double whip GPUs in addition to three other PCIe cards. Um, this is the motherboard series that they use in that machine. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less, they, uh, last I checked box that actually doesn't offer the new Xeons uh, yet. I know they're working on it, but I haven't seen anything from them because uh, we, we have some of their systems here too. Um, but this is, um, they're using the X10 series right now, the one previous to this uh, in that motherboard. So that's one cool way. If you really want to go crazy on internal GPUs, you can, you can use that board. Uh, but it is enormous. So there are only about three or four cases on the market that actually can ha house it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so in total you could have, um, uh, what was it, five GPUs then? Three PCI and you these could. two? two... Yeah. Uh -huh. right. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, you start, you start running into the limits of how much power you can pull, though. Uh, <laughs> right. But, uh, but it, it can be done. We've got a couple of them around here. So. Hmm. Well, yeah, and then the uh, the cop does no object machine right here, um, <laughs> you know, and yeah. he's going to go top end uh, and get crazy. Um, that's pretty unlikely. So, um, uh, so to show you kind of a real world uh, version of this, um, we recently uh, did some builds for our render farm. So we we do a, a render farm refresh of a number of servers every every year, and um, this is the first year that we've incorporated GPU rendering into our farm and we're uh, getting ready to kind of turn these on. Uh, all the builds are done. Mm -hmm. um, and these will be primarily used for Redshift and V-Ray right out of the gate on the GPU side. And then uh, they'll also be useful just for CPUs with Arnold and Maxwell. And then eventually, of course, GPU when those engines, uh, you know, get the GPU support beefed up. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th so these these are the actual uh, configurations that we've uh, we've just recently built, um, and uh, yeah, so I mean we're able to do stay you know 4600 US uh, per machine with three GPUs and a Threadripper seems pretty good. Um, yeah, it seems to so. me this is a very interesting machine uh, for upcoming mm -hmm. Maxwell, especially with three GPUs. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean if you know. If we're getting multi GPU support in Maxwell, and that's something that someone's interested in, and you still wanted to stay in that, you know, four to five thousand dollar price range for a machine, I would do this rather than the 18 core Intel, uh, because you know, with the savings you're going to get, uh, you'll be able to get, you know, an additional GPU or even two, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So. And three, and I guess that that power supply would be enough uh, for if let's say all those three GPUs were running at yeah. the same time. It is now. This is not in a um, in in an overclock like for the for the Werner farm builds that we did. We did we aren't we are not overclocking the processors. Uh, in my experience, um, the thread rippers actually don't respond to overclocking all that well in terms of um, actual kind of measurable performance gains with things like Maxwell. Um, mm -hmm. The you can a little bit, but um, you just don't gain a ton in Maxwell. The processor is already kind of running as hard as it can, more or less. You might get 10% more, but we chose not to do it uh, mm -hmm. in this particular instance. Uh, but um, I've been running burn-in tests on these machines, and I think the highest I've ever seen um, is in V-Ray uh, hybrid mode. And I think maybe 750 watt draw from the wall was about as high as it ever got. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if this were the max, you could go with a lower PSU than this. Um, but I've got a I've got a slide coming up telling you why uh, we chose this particular one. Mm -hmm. um, also because I, I got to get great price on these at the time. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean maybe the savings aren't so so big on the PSUs anyway. Better go with a, a with a good brand and yeah, have yeah. some sort of margin. Right. It's yeah. Absolutely. Like CPUs. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are going to do X299 and you want to overclock, I would highly suggest uh, one of these five boards. Um, these all have the newer uh, VRM designs and can handle the higher overclocking um, power demands uh, more easily than the other ones. Um, and, uh, you know, in between these, it's really going to depend on what are kind of the other features that you're looking for in terms of uh, M2 ports. Uh, some have uh, 10 gigabit networking on board, some don't. Um, so there's just a lot, kind of a lot of other things to consider as far as which one do I want to choose. 
Yeah, I mean, this should be plenty of uh, examples for people yeah. to choose from. Yeah, five boards. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, some of these, I have to, like, I know on both um, these, I think, I believe on all three of um, these up here, you actually can also fit four GPUs on uh, as well. So that's something you may want to consider, mm -hmm. particularly on the WS. I know that you can. Mm -hmm. Up to four. Yeah. yeah. Up to, uh, that's quite nice. Yeah. But, I mean, it would be a pretty noisy machine, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> if you want to <laughs> well, be working next to that. Yeah, you know, that's that's just part of the decision process, right? Um, or just where how, how much how much how much noise can you stand? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so if you really want to go nuts with the GPUs, and and we have actually tested all this stuff, so all the stuff I'm showing you today isn't just crap I pulled off the internet. It's you know, <laughs> okay. yeah, it's like stuff that we have. You know, we're not recommending things that aren't uh, haven't actually been tried. Um, but um, you can pretty easily get four internal ones if you want to go that route. Um, a couple of other interesting things uh, are external GPUs, which can be done in two basic different ways um, with something like this NetStore NA255 box. Um, so this is a, 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 a small chassis that you can buy, and it comes with um, a daughter card that goes into your primary machine, and then it'll run a cable out to this one, and it acts as just an external PCIe case and you can put GPUs in there or you can put whatever you like uh, and you can run up to four in there. So for instance, if you did one of these boards with three GPUs and then another and then added one of these, you actually could run up to seven on the same machine at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the questions I had because I had, uh, um, I mean, the, the connection first of all, but you explained that how it works, the connection between your main a machine and this one and then i suppose it has its own psu right these have their own yes. uh, power yeah. supplies this, right yeah this box has a, a power supply in it um and it has a an interface card in it um that you connect the cables to and it's got the, the now one bad thing about this is the cables are gigantic um so it is a little bit cumbersome <laughs> <laughs> um but and then there are four uh empty slots that you can fit GPUs into and it's got all of the power and everything that you need. Right. And then the card, yeah, and then it's just got a little, um, it looks like a little RAID card actually that goes into your computer. Um, and then it just basically, it's an extension of your PCIe bus and it acts just the same way. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. And uh, yeah. what's the cost approximately of one of these boxes? An empty one, of course, not without the GPUs. Um, I'd have to look. Uh, we have, it's been a while since we got one in, but I, these actually are kind of pricey. I think they're around 1500 US for the mm -hmm. whole setup, uh, plus adding the GPUs. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so it, it's the kind of thing where you really have to need a lot of interactive GPU capability, whereas you don't want to go to something like a, just getting a second PC, get a stick in the, mm -hmm. in the closet somewhere. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of a niche application, but um, you know. And, and how long are the cables? Need. How long? Oh, uh, maybe four. I don't know, one and a half meters, perhaps. Oh, one and a half. Okay. Yeah, I could look. Um, or if you yeah, just poke around on NetStore's website, you can find this stuff. Um, there are a couple of companies that um, do similar types of setups for actual like PCIe extension kind of things. Uh, but uh, this is the the best one that I've been able to find because uh, it's not it's not very loud. And um, what I do like about it though is, for instance, uh, if you don't always want all that extra GPU horsepower, uh, but you do just you know occasionally, you don't have to have this on all the time. So you can mm -hmm. be working on your computer and then oh I'm going to do a GPU render or a couple of them. So let me turn on uh, yeah. uh, the external box. Um, yeah. And I, you, you do have to reboot when you do that, but uh, but it isn't just sitting there, you know, consuming power all the time when you don't need it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah interesting. So, uh, so a little bit newer solution is the Thunderbolt eGPU uh, stuff from uh, Akidio and Sonnet and a few others. Um, this does work on Thunderbolt 3 in both uh, uh, 
in both Windows 10 and the very, very latest uh, Mac OS 10. Um, and then you are limited a little bit, you know, you have to, of course, have a PC that has Thunderbolt, which uh, is not particularly rare, but not all of them support it. Uh, but for instance, the, let's see, all of the, I know both of the first two boards here support Thunderbolt 3, and I think the Gigabyte does, but I, I haven't seen if they have actually put out, um, I haven't actually seen a sample of this board yet. Um, the EVGAs do not support Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but a, a good solution too, if you're a laptop worker and, and you want to uh, have, you know, some GPU horsepower to, to test out Maxwell with uh, as well. Both of these are, are very good uh, boxes to do that with. And I mean, it, it's the same principle, I guess, as the NetStore one. You, it's a box, and you, it's just that you connect it via Thunderbolt. Is that the? Yeah. the thing? Yeah. It mm -hmm. it is, except for it's only one GPU per box. Oh, um, okay, right. And yeah, they're quite a bit smaller and so on. Uh, so you, with Thunderbolt, though, you can connect as many as you like. I think up, up to six, actually. Yeah, on right. the chain. On the chain, uh huh. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, um, you know, connecting a GPU over a Thunderbolt interface, your bandwidth a little bit, um, technically speaking. Um, in something like a 3D rendering application, though, it really doesn't make any difference. Hmm. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, because yeah, 3, 3D rendering by PCIe standards is actually not that bandwidth intensive, uh, it's all computation. You know, once it sends the scene file and the textures to the GPU to render, um, and then it sends an image back eventually. But in the meantime, there really isn't much activity on the PCIe bus. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, okay. It's not, it's not a big concern. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So you could have three on a chain, and uh, well, you could use two, you could use one, you have lots of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've just got some, these are the random thoughts that I added uh, later as far as things that people don't think of if they're planning on, on building a, a computer until they've done it 50 times. <laughs> mm. um, is, yeah, one thing I would not do is skimp on a power supply and get more than you think you, you will need because you may eventually want to add additional GPUs um, and changing a power supply out is kind of a pain. Mm. Um, and another thing is I actually typically buy very PSUs, um, even though I know I'm not going to need that much power um, because, for instance, like the Corsair series um, in the like their 1500 watt supply, the fan doesn't even kick on until it's at about. Um, that's a big help because I almost never hear the power supply fan come on on any of our workstations because we've got big power supplies in them and it never exceeds 60 or 70 percent capacity so mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point and plus i mean considering all the other stuff the, the 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 power supply isn't the most expensive piece in the in the machine anyway so might as well right. get, a, get a good one an oversized one mm -hmm. yeah. yeah good point okay um, good. I think maybe two more of these. If you're using exclusively Maxwell, I wouldn't bother with more than one GPU. Um, yes, by obviously. the time the next. Um, obviously, yeah, today uh, it's just going Yeah, to today. <laughs> um, you know, maybe, maybe plan for it, but um, GPU prices are pretty crazy right at the moment. Um, so that could eat up a lot of your budget. And, you know, you'll probably see a replacement for the Pascal series within the next four to six months. Um, mm -hmm. So I would, you know, maybe wait for that. If you're using other engines in addition to it, then of course that's a different story, but, uh, yeah. but just for today. Um, and if, if the store is near you or anything like the ones like me, I go in and there is literally no GPUs in stock. Um, <laughs> so if you're wondering how, to, how the heck do I actually get one, um, here's one uh, way if you follow uh, Jacob Freeman, who is uh, an EPGA employee, he, he frequently will post on Twitter when they're about to put some uh, stuff up for sale, and it usually sells out within 15 to 20 minutes. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, That's but at least you don't, you, yeah, you don't, you don't have to go on Amazon and pay double what it should be. Uh, mm. but, anyway. So this is so that's the last slide. So any any questions, I guess, are welcome. 
Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thanks a lot for this info. I mean, I, I learned a lot about the, 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 the different, um, well, specifications and especially about these GPU boxes, I guess. A lot of people, Maxwell users, are going to wonder about that, in, especially in, uh, in a short amount of time when uh, mm -hmm. after multi-GPU will be released. So this is good info. And I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. They're gonna watch the recording. I have one qu question from Christoph. Maybe I can even unmute him. Let's see. Christoph, are you there? Hello. Christoph, can you hear me? Well, um, he he had two questions. Well, I guess you answered the first one with the three uh, 1080 Ti's and just a, a 1200 watt PSU, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. But you said that even in hybrid mode with, with V-Ray and those three running, you were using about uh, 700, 800 watts, I think you, you said? Yeah. Yeah, a 1080 Ti doing 3D rendering, um, well, I would count on it consuming about 200 watts, which is actually below what it's rated at, but that's what we've measured them using. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 750 to 800 on a thread with a thread ripper at stock clocks and three 1080s. Um, so, yeah, you should be fine. Okay. Great. And uh, about yeah, the eGPUs, he was wondering, can you use a CUDA-based cards with, um, I mean, uh, sorry, a CUDA-only render like V-Ray Octane if you're using a MacBook Pro because they only have AMD GPUs? I guess that's okay, right? Because it's just like a uh, connection. Right. Um, I haven't tested it extensively, but what from what I'm, I've am i heard and, and read, you can use for instance, uh, any of the Pascal series GPUs in an external box like the Akitio or the, the Sonnet, as long as you have the CUDA drivers installed, it should see it. Mm -hmm. So there's a special oh, CUDA? My, yeah, my answer is probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Go test it. And, stuff. Well, and I, the part of that also is how the software sees it because some, uh, some software that is accessing the GPU um, isn't coded very well and it just wants to use whatever the, the display GPU is mm -hmm. and then other software you can you can select which GPU to use to render so it, it's a little bit in the details how or if that's going to work for you mm -hmm. right understood yeah. um, let's see here we don't have as many attendees today but let's see if I unmute everybody see what what happens in the list hello Oh, I see. I can't unmute more than two, I think. <laughs> Click to unmute. Does anybody have any questions regarding the uh, the materials or, uh, or uh, hardware? Oh, strange. I can't unmute more than two people, it seems. Ah, no microphone today, says Mark. No problem, Mark. Next time. Uh, no, I think that's it. Uh, Steven, Christoph, can you hear me? Uh, Mark says he had a bad experience with the Corsair AX1200. Hmm. Yeah, and Christoph doesn't have a mic either. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's about it. I guess they don't have many questions. Let's see. Okay. Uh, 16, uh, got myself a 1600 watt super flower instead. Super flower? What's that? That's a power supply? Uh, yeah, oh, I have not heard flower? of that. Um, yeah. Or super flower. Yeah. You guys should have microphones because I unmute everybody at the end of the sessions. So it's good to have a talk afterwards. See, Stephen, anybody? Hello? Stephen, can you hear me? Or Marianne? Yeah, there are people joining now for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe they got the time. Uh, uh, the time uh, wrong but anyway uh oh it says christoph he has a question yeah go ahead 
See, this is why you should have a microphone so you don't have to type everything. <clears throat> he says some PC manufacturers say you need two. You mean two power supplies, I, I suppose. And what's your question exactly, Christoph? Oh, oh, two CPUs. He means some manufacturers say that you need two CPUs if you're going to use four GPU cards. Have you heard of that? Um, they might only offer it in that configuration, but that's not. It, there's no technical requirement for that. Um, mm -hmm. One thing you'll run into, like with the i9 stuff, is that it's only got 44 um, PCIe lanes. So when you go to a four GPU format, it may reduce the lane bandwidth, but for something like 3D rendering it with, you know, Maxwell or V-Ray or whatever it is, that's really not going to have any impact. Right. Okay. Well, that I think is a very important thing everybody learned today that, you know, for, for 3D rendering, it's not like with games, which you have massive geometry and textures that need to be sent all the time. It's just, the bandwidth requirement are much less important. So then a box like these uh, eGPUs or NetStore makes a lot of sense for people. Mm, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting also like kind of to see how the GPU rendering in Maxwell develops because um, the particulars of how the software implementation are really going to have an effect on what the best setups are. Um, because in other, if, with some GPU renders, you can do things like um, interactive network rendering so you may be able to stash another pc in the in the closet and then in real time on your main workstation have it contribute to your preview renders uh, v-ray has that capability i don't expect it in maxwell right away but if that were to be developed that would be something where you know you wouldn't necessarily need these external gpu boxes in that type of instance mm -hmm. so right yeah, it will be interesting to see how how the multi multi GPU works in Maxwell. I think every right. Maxwell user is waiting for that as a big news for for this first uh, first part of the year. Hopefully, it's going to be right. out. Um, well, I think two <laughs> CPUs. Christoph saying two CPUs for four GPU cards. Oh, yeah, I guess you answered that uh, already. Uh, so, Christoph, no, uh, it's not necessary in the technical specifications that you need two CPUs if you want to use four GPU cards. Right. Okay, and what time is it? Well, yeah, it's almost exactly one hour, one and a half hours now. <laughs> exactly 7.30 here. So, I guess we'll, uh, we'll end it. We'll end this second episode. And um, again, Dave, thanks. Thank you very much for taking the time and to prepare this and and telling us all, <laughs> setting us straight with with the hardware because you always seem to have uh, access to the greatest toys on the forum. Everybody's jealous of you, I guess. Oh well, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work too, so don't worry about that. But um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm around there. Um, it sent me a private message if I fall asleep for a while. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has uh, has um, you know specific questions so yeah and also i wanted to thank you for making those tests on the on the forum on that page and mm. um i did talk to next limit i'm going to try to help them to re-implement that uh, uh the, the the testing page we had before but just make it mm -hmm. a lot nicer make it uh you know a nicer presentation and maybe i was thinking also we could hook it up with the service to compare with current cpu prices so that we can have like a special graph that tells you, you know, for this moment, the best bang for the buck is the CPU and so on. Right. Um, I'm not sure if you know any of such service where you can get, uh, they have maybe some, uh, uh, you know, you can get the prices from mm -hmm. current CPU prices. Are there any such sites around or services? Um, I know on that one website a lot of people like to use is called PC Part Picker. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how they actually draw their prices, but it does have they have they have some sort of real time feed on you know into the retail environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Take a note of that uh, PC, PC part. That part. might be a lot of that stuff is really regionally dependent, though, so that might might prove challenging. But yeah, we will have uh, you know disclaimers on <laughs> on the graphs and everything. Yeah. <laughs> People don't get exactly that price; they're not gonna go crazy on us. Yeah. All right. So thank you again, Doug, and I'll okay. see you on the forum as usual. All right. Well, and thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem. And uh, maybe you can come back later when we have multi GPU. You have uh, some important things to say. You can you can come back and. and I I'm you. sure I will have a, a whole page full of test data once that <laughs> happens. That's great. So everybody watching this, you know, subscribe to the forum. We have lots of great info there, and hopefully some news about Maxwell soon too. That would be nice. <laughs> All, All right. right. So uh, I'll post this on YouTube and Vimeo as usual uh, for those that want to have replays. Thanks a lot for attending and thank you, Doug, and uh, see you next time.